We are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in the first 12 verses of chapter 2 is a section that uh, he brought the gospel to them in all sincerity. And there was... He stated it from a negative standpoint, uh, how that when they came to Thessalonica, even though they had been uh, shamefully treated at Philippi, they were still bold to preach God's word to the, to the Thessalonians. Did not come with uh, deceit, uncleanness, guile, And that's in verse 3. We looked at that last week. <clears throat> but now then, as you enter into verse 4, there's a strong contrast as to how they did not come to how they did come. Uh, and so he says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel... Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. They were approved of God. Paul had spoken out of the best motives. In the preceding verse, uh, you see a lot of the negative motives that, sad to say, a lot of people do today. Uh, But now then, Paul is speaking of the best motives. The word allowed is from a word which means to examine or to put to the test, to judge as good. BDAG in their lexicon defines it as to make a critical examination of something to determine genuineness, put to the test or examine. And then their second definition is to draw a conclusion about worth on the basis of testing, prove, approve. Here the focus is on the result of a procedure or examination. They were put to the test, they were approved or examined uh, by God or of God. And if you have that uh, Greek uh, verbs that I handed out, it is a passive, uh, perfect indicative. perfect uh, tense, dealing with action that has been completed with continuing or abiding results. God had put them to the test and the results continue, abiding results of that testing. And so they are in a state of continued approvedness by God after having been tested by God. Uh, Obviously the testing by God would certainly include uh, the persecutions which they endured at Philippi, the persecutions at Thessalonica, and the message that he proclaimed, uh, setting forth the truth to that. And that God had put him to the test judged him to be good, judged him to be faithful uh, regarding the gospel of Christ. Someone turn over to 1 1 Timothy 1 and read verses 11 and verse 12. 1 Timothy 1, 11 and 12. God 
God counted him faithful, putting him into the ministry. Uh, that's what God had done, and he, that state of approvedness continued. Uh, Paul had proven himself to be a faithful steward of the mystery of Christ. Someone turn to 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2. The account of us, he has, the church at Corinth, of course, was suffering from divisions based upon men. Paul, Apollos, Cephas, or Peter, uh, having groups call themselves after them. And he has demonstrated the, how you judge a preacher. But now then, he says, let a man so account of us. It's talking about those who are preachers, ministers of the, of the gospel of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. The mysteries of God would be that which God had revealed unto them. Um, it had been a mystery as something that had at one time been hidden, and now it's been revealed. It was hidden during the Old Testament times. Uh, it was set forth by types and prophecies. Uh, but now then it was being revealed. And so he was to be, Paul, a faithful steward of that mystery of God. Uh, and thus the principle in verse 2, it's required in servants to be, that a man be found faithful. Uh, <clears throat> It is a message which Paul preached without any change or alteration. Uh, if you look at the word, even so we speak, the word speak there is present tense. Continue to speak. Uh, they continued to speak the word of God, thus not altering it any way not adding to it, not taking away from it, not changing it or altering it. Uh, that's why he would be considered faithful as a steward of the mysteries of Christ. Uh, that's why here in, he's been approved, he's been tested by God, and he was found to be a faithful steward of that mystery of Christ. He, because he spoke, continued to speak, that message that God gave him without changing and altering it. Uh, the problem that we have so many times is that we change and alter that message. Uh, the denominational world does it all the time. Uh, sadly, even within the church, we have those who will change and alter the message that God has set forth. And that again goes back to the preceding verse uh, that motive of deceit, uncleanness guile uh, that so many uh, use today in order to gain numbers or to gain money, power prestige and all of these other things that really don't make any difference in relationship to God uh, Paul and those who were with him only spoke the word of God. Remember what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4 and verse 11? If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Well, that's what Paul and his company were doing. They were only speaking God's word, nothing else. And it's what every person should do. Far too often, though, we get into the, well, I think this, or I think that, or my church teaches, or my preacher says, and things such as that. 
it always has to go back to what does the Bible teach? Now then, if a man is speaking, if he doesn't speak what God's Word says, then it's to be rejected. If he does speak what God's Word says, it's to be accepted. And that uh, places the emphasis as well upon each one who hears that message that they have an obligation themselves to study to make sure that it is true or whether it's false. But the speaking is to be only God's Word. We also see that they were not to please men. Their work was not to please men. Now then, does that mean that they were to intentionally try to upset people? <laughs> no. But many times the truth makes people upset. You speak the truth anyway. It is the temptation I know of every preacher to please men. <clears throat> the world is always trying to get preachers to compromise the truth. When you don't, you're ridiculed, you are assaulted verbally, I'll put it that way, um, and attacked and all sorts of false accusations are made uh, because you won't compromise the truth. Uh, the mantra of our society is that we must change, that the church has to change, uh, that to be relevant to today's society, you have to change. Well, you can't change God's Word. It's the same, and Christ is the same. First Corinthians, or first... Uh, no, it's Hebrews 13, verse 6. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, the Bible is relevant to today. It, it deals with all of the problems that we would face. It deals with anything that comes up within our life. Our problem is that we don't want to hear it. We'd rather hear something else. Okay, just like uh, in the with the Constitution, try to make it a living doc document where it changes and alters with the time. If you change and alter it, going back to the Bible with the times, then there is no truth. Truth will change, but truth doesn't change. Um, then if you go to this idea that truth will change, you then face the problem that each person is a law to themselves and each person should do whatever they want to do uh, and that God's word might as well be thrown in the trash because it's, that's all the value that it would be. They'll... God, God has always demanded that, and there in Numbers uh, 16 and 17 with the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, uh, they did not respect God's authority that was seen in Moses and, the Levitical, and Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. Uh, and thus, there was a visible demonstration as to who was right on that and who was wrong. Uh, 
Um, but there's always that temptation to compromise. Um, you know, in the Lord's Church, many times we started um, determining success by how many people were in a congregation, how many people they baptized. Uh, I thought it was always interesting as I saw those records, you know, how many of those baptized remain faithful, though. Hmm. That was, would be a whole different matter. But it was all based upon numbers instead of truth. The truth was preached. Uh, and they weren't out to please men. I'm not going to change what God's Word says to please you. Uh, which is what the religious world basically says today. Uh, when we saw back in the 50s and 60s, join the church of your choice. Basically, that was saying, you make a determination as to which you, what you want. As far as the truth, it doesn't matter. As far as God's Word, it doesn't matter. And if you can't find a, one that satisfies you here, you go to someplace else that will satisfy you. Instead of, what we're supposed to do is to get people to change their life to conform with the Bible. What we see today is we're going to con make the Bible conform to people's lives. And thus please men. Paul's statement is very clearly... We're not doing it to please men, uh, to accommodate men. Uh, he asked the Galatians in Galatians 1 and verse 10, uh, For do I persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. There's a lot of preachers even in the church today, who are not servants of Christ, they are servants of man instead. Paul warned Timothy, one of the three that were writing this book and that were working with the Thessalonians, that people would want their ears scratched. Remember 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They want their ears scratched, and so they'll find a preacher that will scratch their ears. Uh, and by scratching their ears, it's basically saying, preaching what people want to hear. Uh, and they'll find a preacher in order to that will preach that type of a message. Uh, Paul's statement to Timothy, though, is in the preceding verse, St. Timothy 4 and verse 2, to preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now then, While Paul told Timothy the time would come where this would happen, we've seen it happen. <coughs> it is happening today. Uh, and thus, the warning and the statement, we've been approved of God. One of the reasons, because we speak God's word, we're speaking the gospel, and we're not trying to please men. And by the way, the word please, pleasing men is in the present tense again. It is continuous action. Uh, the one we are to please is God. 
not as pleasing men, but God. He is the one who tries our hearts, puts us to the test. Uh, And that word trieth there at the end of the verse, it's from the same word as allowed in the first part of the verse. Uh, Different forms, of course. Uh, The allowed is a perfect tense, while uh, trieth is in the present tense. Uh, So he continues to try our hearts. Uh, It's not just a one-time deal. Uh, He continues to try our hearts. Just as kind of an aside, this does show that we can fall away. If God has to continue to try our hearts, and He does, then there is a possibility that He might find us not approved, whereas before we might have been approved. Uh, <clears throat> thus, a falling away from the truth. It is an attempt to get them to preach what uh, what is pleasing to me. Uh, Instead of preaching what God's word is and what's pleasing to him, they won't be be hearing words that are pleasing to them. Uh, And... Let's face it, today there's plenty of people who will give them exactly that. Paul knew that he had to give an account to God as to what he taught. Uh, Now then, is that exclusive to Paul? Obviously not. Each one of us has to give an account of ourselves to God for our life, but also specifically for what we teach, for what we say. Uh, Every jug has to sit on its own bottom, okay? I've got to admit, that's one that I haven't heard. Well, I'm not old enough, enough, that's it. (laughs) I'm still a young whippersnapper, so, uh, you know, he said older preachers, so uh, that was before my time. Uh, (laughs) It's funny, uh, since you said that, that expressions are used some in one location. Everyone has heard that their entire life. You raise in another area of the country, and there's an expression that's there. Well, I've heard that the entire my entire life, and they hadn't heard the other one. Every jug has to sit on its own bottom. Bottom. You, you put a jug down, it's got to sit on its own bottom. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, we're each accountable for what we do and for what we say. Uh, We won't give an account for others. Um, Paul won't have to give an account for what we say. I'm sure he's uh, thankful for that. Uh, I won't have to give an account for what you say. I'm thankful for that. (laughs) Um... We're each going to 
give an account for what we teach and for what we do. And it is God to whom we give an account. He's the judge, not man. Thus why please, try and please men, instead please God. Because he's the one we're giving an account to. Uh, <clears throat> when we please God, we're not going to please some men. You go back to Galatians 1 and verse 10 and what he was saying there. For do I now persuade, <coughs> persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if, if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Pleasing God is going to upset some people. When you set forth the, the principles of Christianity, when you set forth how to become a Christian, it's not going to please a lot of people. Uh, that's why there have been debates through the years in regards to baptism. Why? Because the Bible clearly teaches that you have to be baptized to be saved. And if you're not baptized for the remission of your sins, you're not saved. You're not a Christian. Some people don't like that. So, debates have been held through the years regarding the, that subject. Um, as to living a Christian life. Uh, read a review of a debate that took place just uh, not too long ago uh, between a member of the Lord's Church and a homosexual. And the homosexual was arguing that uh, it is right, acceptable to God, to be a homosexual. Uh, <clears throat> so, when you set that, things like that forth, People aren't going to like it that homosexuality is sin. Fornication, sinful. Uh, when you start teaching about marriage, divorce, and remarriage in particular, then a lot of people, a lot of brethren will get upset. Um, They have a misconception of God and the nature of God. Um, and, and that's true, they do. Uh, but we... <laughs> yeah, God would never send anyone to hell. Um, they, they just simply don't have any concept of what the Bible actually teaches about the nature of God. Henry? Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, things that are clearly taught. I mean, it's not difficult. It's very straightforward, and people will reject it. Um, when you get into the aspect of obeying the gospel, living the Christian life, living, living acceptably to God, it really is not that difficult as far as what God teaches. He makes it plain and simple. Uh, now I realize there's deep areas of God's word that we can... And that's why you know, we can spend our entire life growing and developing and studying God's Word. But when it comes down to those fundamental things as to attaining heaven, God makes it simple for us. And yet those are the things that are so many times rejected and argued about. Uh, <clears throat> it says that God trieth our hearts. From a biblical standpoint, <coughs> the heart is not that, you know, instrument that's in the middle of the chest. When you're talking about from a biblical aspect. Um, the heart instead involves four aspects. 
One is the mind. So a lot of preachers, when they say, they start talking about the heart, they start pointing to the mind, the head. Because the heart, biblically, involves the mind of man. Second, <coughs> second it involves the will. Our, our decisions that we make, our volition. Um, remember Jesus' statement, if any man will to do his will, he's saying forth the will of man, his decisions, what he wants to do. So it involves the will of man. Third, it involves the conscience, uh, that our conscience has to be right. Uh, now then, our conscience can be taught as to what's right and wrong, but still that conscience, that knowledge that we have within ourselves, we know that some things are just right and some things are wrong. Uh, and then fourth, it involves the emotions. Uh, when I think about uh, Christ on the cross and what he suffered, uh, it involves our emotions, it, it invokes our emotions to, and thus a desire to do what uh, God wants. So when he says that God, which trieth our hearts, he's dealing with all of these aspects. <clears throat> Um, and all of those aspects have to, has, have to be in accordance with God's will. Uh, regarding the mind, for example, I got into a discussion just uh, this past week, I think. Uh, someone wanted to come and talk to me about some things that were on his heart. Uh, <clears throat> Well, got involved in the discussion of the mind, and we can control our mind. Well, that's the idea. God, we control our mind. We make sure that our minds are centered upon God's Word. We think about certain things, and we do not think about other things. Uh, that way we can live in, a, in an acceptable way because out of the heart of man, out of that mind of man, comes evil thoughts, evil words. Also comes good things. Uh, yeah, Philippians 4 and verse 8. Uh, things that are good and right and honorable that we are to think about. That's our mind. And we control that mind to make sure we think on those things. Uh, the will, we make a choice. I want to serve God. I want to do what God says within my life. I want to go to heaven. I have that desire. I also have the desire to avoid hell. And spending an eternity of suffering and anguish and pain. Um, that's a choice. That's the will that we make. Now, our choices need to be based upon the mind and the learning that we got God's, uh, that comes from God's Word. The conscience. Uh, conscience is that, you know, it's that little man that starts bothering you in your mind that's when you do something wrong. Again, the conscience can be trained to be in accordance with God's Word, but we need to make you know, sure that our conscience is a good conscience because we're living according to God's will. And then the emotions. Let me put it this way. In our society today, a lot of people base everything upon emotions, their feelings. I feel this about such and such. Well, who cares? Doesn't matter. Our feelings have to be in accordance with what God says. 
not based upon our whims and our desires. Uh, and that uh, I think it's Charlie Kirk who says, uh, or maybe it was Ben Shapiro, that facts don't care about your feelings. Uh, and there's a lot of truth to that. Because people want to base what they say and what they do based upon feelings instead of facts and the decisions that they make. Well, the decisions that we make, the way in which we live, must be based upon God's Word, facts. Not how I feel about it. Baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God, 1 Peter 3, 21. How many times have you heard when someone wants to bring in an instrument, sinful act uh, to the worship? Well, I feel it'd be all right. Or it sounds good to me. Well, that's what they're basing their actions upon their feelings, not upon God's Word. Wycliffe Bible Commentary stated that Paul refutes the Jewish charge that he was preaching an easy message by uh, pleasing men by removing the yoke of the law, Galatians 1.10. The Jews were under a law, the law of Moses, that was a yoke of bondage which they could not keep, nor could anyone else. Now, Christ lived it sinlessly, but uh, that was part of Peter's argument in relationship to the doing away of the old law. Well, Paul was preaching that the old law had been taken away. They were under a new law, the law of Christ. And so, by saying this, these things... He is refuting that charge that the Jews would make. You're preaching an easy message, a message that simply pleases men because you've taken away the law of Moses, that, which is in reality a bondage, a yoke they could not bear. And so you're preaching an easy message. But in reality, he wasn't. Um, we are to... Yes, take our yoke upon him for uh, take our take up our cross and follow him uh, is what Jesus taught us. Uh, well, taking up a cross is not an easy job, not an easy action. Uh, and so it was not a gospel that pleased men, but it was still the gospel of Christ. It's difficult. Matthew, the seventh chapter, uh, that there's two ways, a narrow way and the, the broad way. <laughs> that narrow way was a straight way. And that doesn't mean it's straight, like, you know, as straight as an arrow. It deals with the idea that here is a difficult passage. Uh, and one that you have to look for. It was used of, here's a cliff. With, you have the edge over here, you fall down, but over next to you, you have a, the wall as well. And so you got a straight, a difficult passage to get through. Sets forth the difficulty of Christianity. Uh, I remember the song, I never promised you a rose garden. I see some of you remember that song. Huh? Linda Ronstadt. Linda Ronstadt. I could not have told you for the life of me who sang it, but uh, there's a, a lot of truth in relationship to Christianity about that. Some people obey the gospel and think all of their problems are going to be solved. 
I'm not going to have any more problems than now that I'm a Christian. Everything's going to be nice and easy. <laughs> You're right, the denominations preach that to a great extent. And that's not the way it is. Uh, the, just look at the persecution that Paul has talked about in this book. Uh, that's not an easy, nice, comfortable way. There's a lot of difficulties in it. Uh, and so, that's the type of message that Paul was preaching. Uh, well, instead of going into verse 5... We'll just save that for next week, Lord willing. Uh, but he's going to continue with the thoughts here in verse 5. Uh, and his preaching and teaching in regards to that. But we'll start there, Lord willing, next week.